Welcome back, everyone, uh, to the lecture and film series this year dedicated to Buñuel. We have the pleasure uh, to be hearing about Viridiana from Fernando González de León. Uh, he is Spanish by birth, uh, grew up in Spain, but moved at a young age to the United States, where he has been based ever since, uh, doing his PhD at John, Johns Hopkins University, and he is now presently uh, Associate Professor of History at Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, um, so Western Massachusetts. Um, he he uh, comes to us, let's say, from a more uh, historian's background, cultural historian's uh, background, so I think this will give us a, a very um, uh, vital angle uh, to approach a film like Viridiana, which I think has a lot of historical context uh, loaded into it. Uh, so Fernando is a historian uh, by profession, uh, interested principally in, uh, I guess, the kind of uh, relations between uh, Spanish society and history and the English-speaking world, uh, very much uh, focused on questions of the Gothic, uh, interested right now actually in the works of Edgar Allan Poe and how he himself was influenced by Spanish literature. Uh, so we'll keep our eyes out for... Uh, publications coming out on that topic, uh, but has also had a long uh, passion for the works of Luis Buñuel dating back many decades now and his relations with uh, the Surrealist movement. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, Fernando will be talking to us about Viridiana. We hope to have a 10 minute break and then screen the film. Uh, we'll, be keep, we'll be kept on tenterhooks as to ever <laughs> that, or to what shape that happens. Uh, but right now we'll be uh, hearing from Fernando. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. And um, I know that this is, the, the time has been a bit uh, surrealized and it, it's, it's not what we're supposed to. So I will basically um, kind of not think of the time a bit and hope not to be too uh, tedious or uh, overbearing in my use of your patience, for which I'm very grateful. And um, I should start by um, some, I suppose, fairly uh, obvious observations. I think we should always start with the obvious. And that is that this film uh, is liable and uh, can be approached in a variety of ways. Uh, technical, filmographic, uh, from a surrealist perspective, strictly a surrealist one. Uh, but mm, our history, perhaps, as well. But my own is that of a cultural historian, as uh, Professor Fairfax uh, just uh, mentioned. That is, I'm interested in um, historical methods, and that implies the use of sources, of documents, of contexts, and uh, of um, provability, that is, something that can be proven, and something that is likely. So some of my remarks are totally directly uh, related to documents that I won't bore you with, but others are um, more speculative. And I will point out when they are so, so that we can maintain a, a clear distinction between what is uh, uh, demonstrably so in terms of historical documents and what is... Um, very likely to be so, given um, specific events and readings in the life of Luis Buñuel. Now, this approach, my historical approach, has only recently become more possible. That is, Spanish researchers, in particular, have begun to publish full annotated texts of the director's personal writings, his memoirs, his conversations. And so this includes even a relatively detailed analysis of his private library. And you'll notice that I rely on some of that as well when I talk about the Gothic or about his interest in literature. Um, now, Having said that, what is the importance of this work in Spanish film history? Clearly, very, very prominent. This is one of the best known and most critically acclaimed Spanish films of the, of the century, of the 20th century. And you could, one could say, well, of the Franco era. Well, no, no, no. It's maybe of any era, Viridiana. 
And this is not a gratuitous or coincidental uh, circumstance. As we shall soon see, there are strong reasons for the prominent status of this film in Spanish film filmography and in world filmography and, uh, and world film studies. Now, the director had a personal investment in this movie, personal engagement with the film that is perhaps much more than in others. Uh, in this film, Buñuel looks back at a um, looks at a pivotal moment in his already lengthy career, which had started in 1927, and it's 1961. So uh, he looks back at uh, the uh, influences that have shaped him, and the preoccupations, the thoughts, the ideas that had led, uh, that had always been present in his work. The work contains major echoes, as I have argued elsewhere, and allusions to a variety of previous works in his filmography, such as uh, even going as far back as a, as a film in which he was not the major film director, but as an assistant director, La Chute de la Maison Usher of John Epstein in 1928. And then, of course, going through Las Urdes, uh, the study of Tierra Sin Pan, Las Urdes, Land Without Bread, uh, which was had the honor of being banned by both the Spanish Republic and Franco. And uh, Los Olvidados, done in Mexico, that is his interest in the life of the lower classes, of the underprivileged, of the, the dirt poor. And most critics and scholars now agree that this is one of his most what we can call intertextual films. This is, a, this is one of his films in which he alludes the most to texts in a variety of ways. Now, of course, Buñuel is an extremely textual uh, director. Most of his films are based on works of literature, based on writing. But this film in particular, Viridiana, stands at the crossroads of his Mexican and of his French period. And this uh, alone, if anything else, will make it very significant in his uh, filmic career. Now, I suppose that you are all very, uh, probably to a large degree, very well learned or conversant with the facts of Buñuel's uh, career and life. So I'm not going to... Um, not going to trouble you with too many details, but clearly he was trying. I, his, head, his education and his background is important to understand the movie. This is a, 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 a man born in Calanda, Aragon, whom, and he describes it as a town living in the Middle Ages in the early 20th century, which I think is not an exaggeration. There are some villages in Spain that are still living in the Middle Ages this day. So uh, it's, uh, but this one, Calanda, is a little bit too big now to be medieval, but uh, it's a uh, Middle Ages just in Spain, it never ends. It just, just withdraws, just moves. So, uh, so that's, that's what makes it wonderful. And so he was a devout uh, boy with a strong Catholic background, very devout, very faithful, until he was around 16 when he experienced a drastic change in his perspectives and he embraced atheism. And he embraced atheism with the same devotion and, and, and exaggerated allegiance that he had uh, embraced Catholicism earlier. He was a devout Catholic and he became a devout atheist. And in fact, it was very common for him to say, uh, soy ateo, gracias a Dios, which means I am an atheist, thank God. <laughs> so um, that is, in a sense, clearly and self-analytically reflecting his uh, almost religious devotion to atheism. Um, his boyhood and early readings are also very revealing when we're trying to come up with an understanding of Viridiana. He read a lot Sherlock Holmes, that is this, this detective 
that looks. He was always a lifelong fan of English literature and American literature. That is, his, we tend to think of him as the uh, quintessentially Spanish film director, but this is a man with a great deal more with a diverse background. So he read all of Sherlock Holmes, the sort of the, 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 the detection of hidden motives, etc. And he also read, he says, I read Jules Verne, a great deal of Jules Verne. And then he said, but my favorite was um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and uh, The Mysterious Island. And those are both dramas of a lonely, middle-aged man in isolation and in, and then and, and just basically haunted by dreams of a dead wife. I don't know what this could mean in terms of Viridiana. No idea. We'll see. <laughs> but this is uh, a many other Gothic narratives. So I think that I find that revealing. Then he goes to Madrid, studies very significantly philosophy. And he lives in the Residencia de Estudiantes in a very forward-looking, very advanced Spanish uh, uh, student residence where he meets two of the most important uh, members of what has been called the Spanish generation of 1927, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca and Salvador Dalí, who share a lot of his preoccupations and thoughts. And we shall see at least one of them figure in Viridiana with some prominence. His fascination with film comes out of a uh, German movie, Der Mude Tod, or Destiny, by Fritz Lang, which he sees and just changes his life and turns him. But again, that film, if you've seen it, can give you some, some thoughts and ideas of this issue of haunted search of quest. Um, this is, as I, as I hope to prove, uh, or I hope to, to suggest, a man with a much more uh, universal background, even though he was also extremely local and extremely Spanish or Aragonese, like Dali was Catalan. It's like ultra Catalan, and, and so Buñuel was ultra Aragonese. If you know about Spain, that is not one but many. And this, uh, this, this local identities of Spain. And so he connected himself with, with a certain ethos in his birth region, but trying to make it universal as well in his projection. Uh, in 1925, he goes to Paris and he works with a director that's going to play a very major role in this movie, and it's John Epstein who uh, he films with John Epstein first uh, as, as a simple aide, Mopra, of in 1926, which is based once again on the domestication of a sort of a wild male living in isolation by a woman who tames him. And that may have had actually an influence on that uh, the work of George Sand, the, the novel, 1837, may have had an influence on Wuthering Heights by Bronte, which Buñuel himself would later film. So he picks up a variety of interesting ideas and thoughts from his apprenticeship with Jan Epstein. And this apprenticeship with Jan Epstein, I think, is one of the darkest chapters in his, in his biography, one of the ones that is least understood. And nonetheless, like things that are least understood, extremely important. Then he also works on one of Buñuel's favorite Gothic texts, The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe uh, with Jan Epstein in, eight, in 1928. He's collaborating at this time with Ramon Gómez de la Serna, which is one of Spain's foremost Edgar Allan Poe students. So his connection with Poe seems, once again, fairly easy to suggest. Maybe not to demonstrate it absolutely, since Buñuel was very careful to always deny influences. Uh, this is something that he was, he was almost predictable. As if you asked him, uh, did, were you influenced by, uh, by I don't know, Goya, for example, like a fellow, fellow Aragonese artist? He was like, saying, no, 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 I, I'm not influenced by anyone except Galdós. 
Benito Perez Galdós, the Spanish Charles Dickens of the 19th century, of whom he just yeah, surely read religiously. But he was so we're talking about an elusive person, as I said before, uh, in in many ways. Uh, he engages at this time with the Surrealist movement. We all know everything about this. Goes to Spain during the Republic, films the uh, this this film Las Urdes, which is a crude and at the same time oniric or dreamlike depiction of extreme rural poverty and ignorance, which was ban banned by the Spanish Republic and banned by Franco as well for a very unflattering depiction of the Spanish rural world. Uh, he goes to, into exile, f doesn't find employment in Hollywood despite presenting many Gothic projects to the Hollywood directors and producers, including uh, The Beast with Five Fingers, The Midnight Bride, and others he, that is, his engagement is with, um, with this sort of a dark gothic film. This is how he wants to sell himself to Hollywood. It doesn't work. So he goes to Mexico, and there, as you know, he has uh, is picked up by a few producers, and he has some successes, uh, although he also cuts with a lot of uh, friends, like, for example, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, and others in Mexico City who see him as a bit of a loose cannon, someone who does not adhere to the strictures of uh, Marxist-Leninist presentations. I forgot to tell you that he had joined the Communist Party, even though he also denied that in the, uh, while uh, working for the Spanish Republic. Um, other Mexican films at this time contain substantial Gothic elements, Ensayo de un Crimen, El, Abismos de Pasión, based on Wuthering Heights, La Morte en Jardin, and uh, other works of this sort, including, of course, his most uh, innocuous work of his Mexican uh, period, Robinson Crusoe, uh, which again is a gothification of the character of Robinson Crusoe, the typical situation of a man living in isolation, having psychosexual and religious temptations and dealing with them, even though he did not like Daniel Defoe's novel, so he says. Uh, again, there's a level to which we can accept or hold ourselves aloof from some of the things that Buñuel says about himself. Um, he also worked on other Gothic projects that never came to fruition, including filmic versions of J.K. Hoisman's Lava and of Matthew Lewis' Ur-Gothic, ultra-Gothic, uber-Gothic novel, The Monk, which is, of course, uh, develops in Spain. It's played, it, it takes place in Spain. That Gothic novel. Um, when he is in the, in, his, in the late 50s, he meets uh, Gustavo Tri Alatriste and Silvia Pinal, the uh, Mexican actress who will play Viridiana in this movie, and they opened to him, for him, a world of international connections that, that had been previously closed to him. Now, he's invited to film Viridiana in Spain, and the reason why he accepts, even though he is obviously a political exile from the Franco government, is that he's paid, I think the figure is three times, three times what the Mexicans could pay to him as a director. So he sees it as an opportunity to deliver <laughs> an interesting work to the government and to, at the same time, get paid for it. It's a win-win situation for, for Luis Buñuel. So he goes back to Spain, and there he is uh, sponsored by Juan Antonio Bardem, major Spanish director during the Franco era, Luis García Berlanga, another major one, and Carlos Saura. These are three of the most prominent directors of the era, and they were all leftists or communists. And uh, their uh, political alliances were well known by the Franco government. They were just basically, as long as they did not openly pursue these things, 
they were allowed to work, they created a film production called Uninsi, and they brought Buñuel to film the first work in, in, in Uninsi. These are going to be new avant-garde films that were going to be on the margins, though allegedly not overtly subversive or in defiance of official Spanish government perspectives, which were ultra-Catholic, as you may imagine, and conservative. And so um, he is through a variety, so through a very interesting historical coincidence of circumstances, allowed to return to Spain uh, two and a half decades after leaving it to work on a project. Now, I'll speak in a minute about the political circumstances in Spain that lead to his uh, return, but um, this is just should uh, flash forward a bit and tell you that the success of Viridiana in the festival, the film festival in Cannes, leads to his um, interna internationalization, that is to his uh, second French period that's going to last from 1962 to his retirement in 1978, in which he once again becomes a European director and not a, a man in the, in the, in the corners or in the, on the edges of um, major filmmaking. That's, that's how he saw himself in Mexico. Well, what could have led the Spanish government, uh, wh which uh, uh, argued that its philosophy was uh, national Catholicism, that is, this was the official ideology of the Franco government, what could have led the Franco government to accept this man back to film in Spain, a well-known, I mean, the police in Spain had his files, which have also now come to light. That is, they knew, <laughs> they, knew they knew more about him than I knew. Uh, it's, uh, you know, blasphemer, uh, communist, I just, well, the whole catalog. And what led to this? because the Franco government up to that time was not known for its uh, liberal attitude towards uh, filmmaking. So I'm going to lead to this. Well, as I said, I told you that I am a historian, a uh, cultural historian, and, and as much as a person who's interested in film. But there are two franquismos, two moments, two periods in the history of the Franco uh, government, the Franco regime. The first one begins with the um, victory in the Civil War, and even before, in which this, this Franquismo is isolationist, ideologically rigid, uh, posits the view of Spain as engaged in a permanent national crusade for Catholicism, uh, is essentialist, that is, that he believes that there are not many Spains or various Spains, as perhaps had always been the case, but one essential, unique Spain that runs on challenge, on change throughout history, on evolving in the dimension of historical time. And this was a regime that also from 1939 until 1955 or so pursued a policy of economic autarky, that is trying to make Spanish industry self-sustaining, cutting off outside trade, um, pursued a policy that in many social ways was fascist. That is fascist in the sense not only of uh, ideological rigidity, but also of um, welfare programs for the poor, social support, health care, free education, a variety of other issues. That is, it was this attitude towards the poor is going to play a role in this film. The second Franquismo, the second Francoism, begins in the late 50s when Spain accepts American bases in its territory in order to participate in the United States Cold War. And this, as a result of this, 
Franco uh, turns away from national Catholicism, from isolation, from autarky, towards technocratic government and something called desarrollismo, that is trying to turn Spain into a, an economic, economically prosperous, materially prosperous society, opening to the outside, mass tourism, and the projection of an image of a festive, uh, carefree, modern Spain. Tourist posters, postage stamps. This has been studied fairly well. Here I am not relying on my own discoveries, just on what is historically accepted. And I think it fits here. The Uninci project that brings Buñuel back to Spain fits within this pattern of presenting to the world an image of an, a more open and tolerant Spain. It would badly backfire, but that's not something that was, of course, understood beforehand. As is well known, the main uh, plot of the film, the script, was presented by Buñuel and, and Alejandro, Alejandro to the Franco censors, and it was approved with minor changes. Now, this may seem surprising once you, which, once you consider what you're going to see. This was approved by the official censors. Buñuel was only asked to change a few details, especially he was asked to change the ending of the movie. And he was very glad to accommodate. As he said, I made it worse. <laughs> sure, we'll change it. In the end, uh, Viridiana was supposed to, I, I don't want to have spoilers, just for those of you who have not seen the movie. By the way, how many of you have seen the film before? Okay, no, that's a tiny minority, so I definitely should not produce spoilers. Uh, there'll be one at the end, but I couldn't help, I couldn't help myself. But uh, there is a, um, the ending was changed from a suggestion of fornication to a suggestion of something a bit more complicated. And that you'll, we'll talk about that. So that's what he said. And then once he did that, they, the Franco censors, let it, let it go through. The film was presented at the uh, Cannes Film Festival. He won Buñuel uh, a Palme d'Or, a Golden uh, Award for his work. But then the Vatican, L'Osservatore Romano, saw the movie. And oh, they had a different perspective. And I, then I wonder, I mean, I know that Franco censors were a bit thick, but, <laughs> okay, what, you know. Because <laughs> this, this, is, this is a beautiful thing about censorship. You can always elude it. But uh, that's, what creates, that's what creativity is, eluding censorship, even your own. So uh, he, uh, the Salvatore Romano published a scathing review of the movie. And then this forced the hand of the Franco government and they had to shut it down. So then um, the, one of the, the president of Uninci, uh, Munoz, went to Venice to pick up the award because Buñuel was in Paris and was working already on his other film projects that he would develop, like the diary of a chambermaid and so forth. So, so he couldn't go to Venice. So he went and that earned him uh, being fired when he got back to Spain. When he got back to Spain, he was fired and he was actually argued, and again, I don't know whether this is true, but the director argued that Franco had seen the movie personally and had approved. <laughs> Franco had not seen anything, so why am I being fired? <laughs> he argues, when El Generalísimo has seen the movie and now found it objectionable. What is, why am I being picked on? And obviously, Uninci, the, the whole Institute of, uh, of, of Film in Spain was closed, shut down. However, and it was shut down not only for alleged blasphemy, but also for contempt for the poor. And by the way, this is also something that earned Buñuel a great deal of condemnation from his leftist friends. 
that is the picture of the poor and of social action in this movie is far from Marxist-Leninist or edifying. Um, and so he was more of an isolated man, Buñuel was, at the end of this process, but perhaps that was exactly what he needed to be accepted in French uh, film once more. He will go on to do things. By the way, he was allowed to go back to Spain in 1970. I remember this when I was a child. I'm that old. To film Tristana. So he went back to Spain and filmed Tristana in 1970 without much trouble. Now, I was going to give you a synopsis of the film. I don't think I should. I, I, I think this is you should be shocked or surprised by yourselves. So I'll skip over that. But uh, one major important, th important issue that concerns me is the sources of this film, because Buñuel co-wrote the script. And I think that the resonance and the permanence of a film like this depends on the sources as much as on its filmic approach. Um, the fact that the sources are very diverse should not surprise us despite the fact that Buñuel was a fairly, fairly brusque individual and could be very sort of dismissive of scholarship and attempts to, to, to elaborate his movies, he was an extremely well-read individual and a highly educated one. So that we should not, uh, for example, he tells uh, Max Aub his conversationalist uh, uh, recorder, he says, you know, I would be again, this is Buñuel, I would be again illiterate, if I could, in order to escape culture. Maybe I have read too much, even though I detest bookish studies and talks and opinions about books. I feel a little asphyxiated by all this, and my ideal is to return to childhood when there is no reading. So we could take that, yes, to be an anti-intellectual statement, but it was also a confession, because no one is anti-intellectual before uh, like that, with a university education and a, and a library like that without having given it some thought. So I'll, I'll bring up some major sources of Viridiana that you might consider as you're watching the film. First, I would say, consider the Catholic and the Christian tradition, what, lo, what irked the anger of l'Osservatore Romano in 1961. Buñuel, I told you already, was an ateo, gracias a Dios, an atheist, thank God, and he made you know, a big deal out of it. And few directors have engaged in such an attack, protracted, continuous on Catholicism. On the other hand, few directors have integrated so many elements of Catholicism in their work. So it's a very interesting love-hate relationship with Catholicism in this, in this movie and in Buñuel's career. The best example of this would be Lache d'Or in, in during his early French period. Um, look, for example, at the passion kit that Viridiana, in this movie, brings and carries in her luggage and that later gets cast into the fire. Um, or consider, for example, the ironic use of music, of religious music, of Handel's Messiah, of Mozart's Requiem, and even of Mozart in a more subtle way at the very end. Um, the major Catholic source here will be Saint Viridiana. Saint Viridiana was an Italian uh, hermit, was connected to Spain through in the 13th century through a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, to Saint James of Compostela. And after she came back from Saint James of Compostela, she cloistered herself for the rest of her life 34 years in a cell, which he was visited by St. Francis of Assisi. Again, you may think, we may think, well, okay, except for the name, what is this? What is the point of 
that. Well, very interesting, because the name Don Jaime is one of the Spanish uh, versions of James. So just like Saint Viridiana was transformed by her pilgrimage to Saint James of Compostela, Viridiana in the film is transformed by her pilgrimage to Don Jaime, Don James. <laughs> Not exactly of Compostela, as you will see. So um, again, the allusion is it's rather obvious and clear. And Buñuel was inspired by a painting in a Mexican museum of St. Viridiana. And there are very important pic pictorial aspects in this movie. But this is not the only Christian painting to play a primary role in this film. There is something rather obvious, which is the long iconographic tradition of Christ's Last Supper which, uh, you know, the famous Leonardo da Vinci fresco in Milan that also appears paradise in the movie. And this version that Buñuel produces is a tableau vivant. It's a type of art form of the 19th century in which actors would dress like famous historical figures and appear in three dimensions in places where people would pay to see them, the tableau vivant. So the tableau vivant of the Last Supper appears in Viridiana. Um, this scene of the Last Supper in Viridiana, this parody, was another one of those red rags in front of a bull for l'Osservatore Romano. This issue of, you know, the Last Supper played by rapist beggars, which is what you will see, and uh, with Christ being played by Don Luis Buñuel himself. <laughs> the, the figure of Christ in Viridiana is Buñuel. He plays himself, puts himself into the film. This was very scandalous. And by the way, if you're interested in movie history on a larger perspective, this parody was in itself parodied by another movie, another film by Mel Brooks, History of the World Part One in 1981. The issue of, you know, the photograph of the Last Supper, it's kind of obvious to see what the genealogy of this is. So there is, it's a film with, um, with resonance. Yet another famous Christian painting appears in the film also as a tableau vivant, and it is the Angelus, the painting of the Angelus of Jean-François Millet, 1859. It's of two peasants bowing down in prayer at dusk in the fields. Now here, this is very important. Here, once again, Buñuel is entering into a dialogue with his former collaborator and friend, Salvador Dali. Um, in 1955, Dali had done his, probably his most religious painting, The Last Supper of Salvador Dali. Well, here comes Buñuel, and thus, in 1961, only six years later, this is my Last Supper. <laughs> it's quite, quite a different one. Uh, not at all pious or theologically correct. And the same goes with the Angelus. This is something that has fascinated Dali, and Buñuel picks it up and distorts it in a Buñuel-esque fashion in Viridiana. Uh, you will see the, the, the moment in which uh, Viridiana prays with the beggars in sort of this vowed condition. In, in, but, but obviously, in this case, uh, the Angelus of uh, Buñuel it's not, does not lead towards sanctification. But it's an announcement of the corruption and victimization of the female. Um, furthermore, the name Viridiana where does, that, where does that come from? What are the roots, what are the origin of this name? 
Well, the name is immediately, as soon as we talk about this, we begin to see something about the structure of the movie that I'll briefly speak uh, about later. You have Viri, the genitive of man, and you have Diana, Viri Diana. Diana is the Roman goddess of the hunt, and she's also a target in Spanish. When you say Diana, una Diana, you're talking about a target that you shoot at. Uh, it's obviously connected to the arrows that the goddess Diana carried uh, with her. And uh, the tributes of uh, the attributes of, Vir of Viridiana were inaccessibility, virginity, impassivity uh, in, during the classical era. Diana was worshipped throughout the Roman Empire, even here in Germany. There are temples of Viridiana in Wiesbaden that have been recently discovered. So it was extremely widespread, but it was especially worshipped in Spain uh, during the Roman era. In the Renaissance, the myth of, Viri, of, of Diana, of la, the, the goddess Diana, was given a new lease on life, and it appears in William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, in connection with a life of chastity, perhaps a coincidence, of a nun, which, as you will see, has connections with this film. Um, Diana, the goddess, had, re had already appeared in, a, in an earlier film by Jean Cocteau, the Beauty and the Beast of 1948. And there are other issues, uh, Neoplatonic, opposition of sacred and, prof uh, and profane love, the myth of Pygmalion. Uh, I'm going faster because I, don't, I want to make sure you get your break. And um, the myth of Pygmalion, the myth of Orpheus, uh, and also the Rabelaisian carnival. This, this carnival situation in which human, uh, in which lower class individuals get to upset and overturn the traditional social structures. More contexts appear in this film, very easily accessible. The Spanish picaresque tradition, Spanish paintings by Diego, de, Diego Velázquez, the drunkards or the triumph of Pacas. Uh, Spanish paintings by Francisco de Goya in the early 19th century of the lower classes run amok. Um, there is a great deal of what is pictorial in this movie, even though Buñuel has not been considered a pictorial author. Uh, he does use paintings. Um, more. The legend and tradition of Don Juan. Buñuel was very interested in Don Juan, in the notion of Don Juan, the Spanish seducer. He had uh, worked in plays in the Residencia de Estudiantes in Madrid, in which reenactments of Don Juan and so forth. So the myth of Don Juan was very dear to him. Now you could clearly see this in this movie. Uh, there are two Don Juans in this film. There are two almost of everything. There are two Don Juans. One is a failed Don Juan. Old, <laughs> past his due date, unable to, to even carry out his business, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's, uh, he's basically an over the hill Don Juan, which is Fernando Rey, which is probably how Buñuel sees himself. Probably how Buñuel sees himself as 62, uh, uh, the, the, the character of Fernando Rey. And then there is a younger Don Juan, Paco Raval, Francisco Raval, uh, in this film, which is Jorge, whom, by the way, I briefly met 30 years ago in a bar, <laughs> uh, the, the actor that plays Jorge, and one of the most brilliant Spanish actors of the late 20th century. But... I want to leave you with a consideration of, um, I don't want to run too long, but uh, I'm afraid I already may have. So, such is life. There is a, uh, there is a very uh, important tradition that is at work here. Don Juan, Diana, the Spanish picaresque. What brings all of these things together? What brings a lot of these things together is the Gothic tradition. 
the tradition of the Gothic genre. And you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the Gothic genre, some of the most important works I would imagine, for example, Bram Stoker's Dracula. If you think of something that has been presented on film ad nauseum, has been Bram Stoker's Dracula. And so what are the, um, in what regard is this another example of Buñuel's preoccupation with the Gothic? Well, we have considered reaction against the Enlightenment, emphasis on the irrational, the supernatural, sexual passion, perversion, deviancy, based on a previous trauma experienced by a dominant male character, Entram entrapment, imprisonment by a Gothic host, Remember Jonathan Harker in Dracula's castle? If you're ever the host of a Gothic, uh, if you're ever the, the, the guest of a Gothic host, prepare for a long stay. <laughs> Don't ever be a guest of a Gothic host. That's advice for the young people. Uh, he'll never let you go because he wants you to be like him. And uh, that's the problem with the Gothic host. He wants to turn you into a double. Um, isolated location, castle or mansion or stronghold where a victim is defenseless, innocent, unaware victim, vulnerable, virginal, and sexually alluring young woman, older male victimizer with devious means to obtain his goals, overbearing presence of a dark and mysterious past. These are all accepted elements of the Gothic consensus among scholars. Incest and other taboo violations, such as voyeurism, fetishism, sexual obsession, assault and rape, uh, attack on Catholicism and organized religion, and on the hierarchies of the old regime, especially the aristocracy and the clergy, juxtaposition of the medieval and the archaic versus the modern and the progressive, bafflement and frustration of the modern and the rational, and return of the repressed what's been left behind in the buried past. Um, I would suggest that the film contains all of those elements, more even than surrealism. Um, so that in a sense it is Viridiana is Buñuel's most gothic film, but that the gothic genre helps him to express particular perspectives which are very useful to contemporary Spain. I'm going to skip over a lot because I really would like you to have a break, right? We have, uh, Daniel, we have what, till like 9.15, 9.30, right? Uh, yeah, a few more minutes. Yeah, a few more minutes. Okay, I, um, I'll alert you to another, another pole of interpretation here, which is the two Spains. This is a very familiar Spanish historical debate and cultural. Spain seems to be always at war with itself, sometimes hot war, sometimes cold war. This is one Spain is, I'm giving you a cliche version, but it's for abbreviatures purpose and to save time. Traditional, Spain, Catholic, religious, uh, skeptical of technology, and the other one is forward-looking, open, modernistic, atheistic, anti-clerical, and pleasure-oriented. You will see that dichotomy, which is part of the Gothic, in its application to Spain in this movie. Well, I hope you see it. If you don't see it, that's fine. You don't have to see it the way I see it. But uh, it's not, you know, I'm not Franco. So, uh, it's just, but I'm just saying that, you know, you, you could see it that way. You know, I offer it to you as, as a perspective, that's all. Um, I was going to, I, I, I really want to end with, uh, with an invitation for you. An invitation to consider dualities in this movie. Two Spains, two parts of the film. Two types of characters, two types of situations. Symbols like the knife and the switchblade knife that is also a cross. Oh, that also made the Catholic hierarchy very upset. 
Ah, uh, this switchblade knife with a cross. Um, consider all those objects and parts of the film and consider the contrast between them as you watch the film. As you watch the film, is this a unitary film? I'm not trying to put thoughts into your head, but to give you some ideas of how to perhaps approach it. Is this a unitary film or are there here two films uh, connected through one thread? Sex. <laughs> that is, 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 this, is this the link? Just put it this way. What, what is clear is in this dual, I think there's a dual or mirror like structure in Viridiana. And that Buñuel is constantly playing with these dualities that are historical, that are cultural, and that are personal, and that are very essential parts of the Gothic genre. I will conclude with um, asking you, to, if you can remember after all of this, to consider that last scene in Viridiana, the very end. Um, in the end, uh, Jorge, Viridiana, and uh, the trusted servant end up in a little card game. And Jorge says, play with the Spanish baraja, the Spanish deck of cards, which is different from the, uh, the other decks of the, the English deck of cards. And there's a game called Jugar al Tute. And in the end, Jorge says to Viridiana, Ah, prima, ya sabía yo que cuando te vi que íbamos a terminar jugando al tute. I knew as soon as I saw you that we were going to end up playing tute. <laughs> and then the camera backs out, you'll see. This is the last scene in the film. That scene, it's emblematic of the entire film. And I don't think it has received enough attention. What does it mean, tute? What does it mean of that word, to play tute? To play tute means in Spanish many things. It's a card game that is played in pairs. In pairs. But you will notice that the scene has three people. There are three sitting at the table playing pairs, playing doubles. Again, it's typically surrealist of suggesting one thing and then delivering something that challenges perspective in order to make you reconsider. But then also consider what the word tuteca means. It can mean tutear, to deal with the familiar tu in Spanish, which is not usted, which is what should be used for those folks that you have respect with or don't know very well. This tutear means becoming very familiar. So jugar al tute, to play tute means we're going to get, we're going to, get to know each other very well. And uh, this word tute also recurs in uh, Mozart's, for example, Così fan tute, the opera from 1790, which you know is an opera buffa of love and intrigue and deceit. And uh, which means everyone does it. <laughs> However, as the camera movement clearly underlines in this last scene, this is a surreal final scene of three persons playing doubles. It's an impossible game that everyone plays, but that by its very nature, nobody can ultimately win. Except Buñuel and us, of course. So have our break. Thank you. I'll just start um, the ball rolling with maybe asking you if you can talk more about the allusions to Dali in the film and also uh, La Chute de la Maison à Cher. Uh, by Jean Epstein, film from 1928, which, as you mentioned, 
uh, Buñuel was an assistant director on. Uh, how does that film kind of echo itself in, in this one? Well, it was the first film in which uh, Buñuel got some very real director experience. And the first two that he worked with, Epstein, uh, John Epstein, he had worked in a variety of capacities, uh, you know, from most trivial to, you know, more complicated ones. But he was a student of John Epstein, and in the, uh, in the, in the Chute de la Maison Ocher, there are um, sequences and scenes that are very, that, that definitely remind us of this one, of the, the setup in itself, the isolated house, uncultivated fields, a half crazy or half mad owner with, um, with a dark past that, that is all there. But um, now from a more technical perspective, you can see that there are necrophilic the, the, the scenes of, of implicit rape. There's one in La Chute de la Maison Acher, which is easy to find, it's on YouTube, it's really very accessible. And it's actually, by the way, I recommend it as, a, as an excellent film. It's one of the best renditions of Poe, of Edgar Poe, uh, in, on, on, on any time. And the particular scene that you will find very uh, evocative is the, um, the, the, the dead Lady Madeline and the implicit um, you know, desire that the camera shows for her, even the angle, the traveling, everything. Is, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to see the music. Uh, added to the film, so that there is a, a clear um, element here of, of a reminiscence, perhaps, by Buñuel, of his earliest experience as a, an assistant film director. And later on, he, he tried to play that down, and he said that he had done very little work with Epstein, but um, there's evidence that that's not the case, that there are... Um, other moments in, in La Chute de la Maison uh, for example, uh, focus on animals, toads, vermin, that are, again, sort of reflective of Buñuel's interest in the animal world as being the, the world of sincerity, of actual, this is how we are, that is. And you see it in this movie as well, um, there's this... There is kindness to animals, but there's also brutality. And there's some of that as well in La, La Chute uh, de la Maison Asha. And there's also, furthermore, the issue of painting, and, um, and which is, plays a major role in the Epstein film in 1928, because it is a painter. Uh, the F Epstein film is a combination of several stories by Poe, including the oval portrait which is about how a painter can vampirize the subject and take away the, the, the living essence of, his, uh, of the person that he paints. And in this film, there's, there's some references to that. But I think that the, to, to, to the second part of your question, the engagement with Dali, number one is the, the, the parody of The Last Supper which takes place here. And by the way, you obviously all realize that Buñuel is, uh, is the, the blind beggar Amalia, right? You know, this is, this is, you're not surprised by that. He, I think he plays the longest in this film of any of his films, and, and that he really puts himself into it, which again underlines the personal nature of this Has movie. Has the most dialogue, I think. And the most dialogue, and I mean, he, he just puts in there. So he's, he certainly, again, underlines this, this collage, this, this, the, the personal, intimate nature of this movie for Buñuel. But the pictorial, to go back to that issue, is not only The Last Supper, but also the Angelus, which we mentioned, and then other other scenes of painting that take place um, of, of of crude religious paintings, which could be might be construed as sort of barbs directed at his former 
uh, collaborator, Salvador Dali, who was at this time doing a very significant amount of religious painting and had turned into a very, uh, f according to, at least to what he said, fervent Catholic supporter of, uh, of the government in Spain. So that there is, I, I think there is, there are those angles in the film, this was, just as there are musical angles, pl plentiful. Um, and I hope that those are the two major answers I will provide. Uh, Bjorn has a roving mic, I think. Yeah, do we have a question? Thanks very much for your lecture. I have two questions. Number one question is uh, the issue of contempt of the poor. Not only Rome blamed Buñuel for that, but also his leftist friends, which is very strange. If you think about Brecht, the Three Penny Opera, shows that the beggars are a group of, it's a, it's a racket. It's like the mafia, all right? It's always the same story. And of course, this past portrayal for all of society. I mean, they exclude people who look different and so on, you know, who have stains and so on. So, and obviously, the 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 leprosy guy, he is the guy who puts on the dress mm -hmm. of the woman and acts like a woman, transgender-wise, blah blah blah. So that's that's very interesting. Uh, I didn't remember that actually that scene. Um, so I I don't get what was so much uh, for the, for his friends, contempt of the poor here. I don't I don't really see it because even in Marx, as you know, uh, the lumpenproletariat, the subproletariat, is one you can't rely on clearly. And this is historically and systematically true. And the second point is, um, I'm not really sure if your description as gothic gen genre is com correct. Of course, we can always talk about genre, that's, that's a problem. But isn't there usually in, in the Gothic genre, if you look at Sherlock Holmes and so on, there's always a resolution and usually a scientific resolution. Gothic genre is a genre of the late or middle 19th century. Even if you think about Frankenstein, yeah, this is early 19th century. So this is a, a, there's a belief in science in the Gothic genre and that's a belief in progress, in a sense. So pseudo-enlightenment kind of belief. Uh, the real romantics, of course, were not like this. And also, I don't think that the surrealists believed in this kind of resolution or scientific advance. So maybe you can say a little bit more about that or contradict me. No, no, no. I, I think there is, on, on the first point, that it has that concerns the the uh, the handling of, of the portrayal of the poor. One could look at this from a Marxist. Okay, let's let's look at it from a from a Marxist angle. And then what what can they can easily say? Well, Buñuel could, who was a, a member of the Communist Party in the 1930s, even though he later attempted to deny it uh, when this when he lost this enthusiasm. Um, there is, it, it's, it's not that it's not necessarily the issue of lumpen proletariat. There are some that are probably so, but others in that crowd of beggars that are just poor misfortunates that are not criminal. But, um, but the, the issue is that, that what the uh, Marxist, to go along with what you say perhaps, uh, the Marxist defense of this portrayal is that what we have here is a failure of private charity, the failure of personal solutions to a, to a much larger socioeconomic um, problem. And that therefore, this is bourgeois charity that could never work. It's religious charity, so it's, it's, it's bound to fail. There's only the only uh, solution to the problems of the poor is the conquest of the state and the establishment of a dictatorship of the proletariat. So you, one could see it this way, but in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the, 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 the portrayals of the poor as being, in a way, responsible for their own circumstance and portrayals of the poor as being having agency, as they're shown to have, 
and of misusing that agency. That is, what you have here in the film, you could also look at it as a dictatorship of the proletariat. That's what they establish once the owners are, 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 are leave, and the results are chaotic and destructive. And this upset uh, a great many of his leftist friends in, uh, in Mexico, uh, isolated Buñuel further from the Latin American left. Uh, for example, isolated him to a significant degree from the Cuban regime um, that had invited him to come and film in Cuba. This is the Cuban Revolution, 1959. This is 1961. And this turned off, <laughs> as, turned them off as much as he turned off the ultra Catholic Franco regime. So that there is, to, so, so yes, in orthodox terms, one can see a Marxist justification for this perspective. But that's not necessarily how orthodox Marxists saw it at the time. And I suppose I'm kind of trying to speak like Buñuel. Now, about the second point on the Gothic. Well, there are Gothic go through a series of stages. The, there is a rational Gothic, uh, Radcliffe, the mysteries of Udolfo. Gothic begins in the well, 1760s with Horace Walpole and the castle of Otranto, and there are definite unexplainable supernatural elements there. So without a doubt, Gothic has a, a sort of a two-track way of going at it, the, the natural Gothic and the supernatural Gothic. Now, the author of the Gothic who most influenced Buñuel by his own admission was the Marquis de Sade. And the Marquis de Sade liked the Gothic for all of these, the themes of imprisonment and, and, and exertion of power and, and, and for lay, lay, you know, laying bare all of the power dynamics of social relationships and personal drives. He liked that and the, the animalism also of the Gothic, but he did not like, he did not approve of the supernatural in the Gothic. So I would say, yes, the Gothic has, for example, Matthew Lewis, the monk, what is it, 1798, that Matthew Lewis, the monk, Buñuel wanted to film this work and wrote a, worked on a script for it, which never came to fruition. But Matthew Lewis's The Monk, which is one of the most over-the-top Gothic novels probably ever written, is supernatural. <laughs> Matilda turns out to be a demon <laughs> in the end. So that there are there's the rational Gothic and uh, perhaps uh, Conan Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes that you allude to, even though, again, Conan Doyle has two tracks as well. That is, he, he works with... Uh, naturalistic, rational Gothic, which would be the Hound of the Baskervilles. But then if you look at his uh, more recently published collection of short stories by Oxford University Press, they deal with, uh, you know, like Lot 249 uh, and others that are not naturalistic. So that's my angle. But I mean, if I say, what is Buñuel's preferred Gothic style? It's the naturalistic. But with um, allowing for the fact that he also admired the other, the other Gothic, the, the rational and supernatural. And that's kind of a sort of my long answer to, to, to what you say, but it, you, do make, you do make a good point that this is the offense of many on the left at this, and on the right, at this depiction of the poor is when you could have could have responded. <laughs> I don't know that he ever did, actually. I don't know that he ever did, that he ever actually explicitly said, well, this is a failure of private charity. This is not, Buñuel was not given, I think, to making extreme ideological pronouncements at that time. I don't think anymore. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, Lenin uh, called the revolution the festival of the oppressed. And that's pretty much what we see here, isn't it? The festival of the oppressed. Yes. Um, but, but which has all its own kind of excesses and so on and so forth. Uh, kind of carnivalesque quality, let's say. It, it's, it's a revolution, yeah. It is, it is a, it's an uprising of the, of, of the deepest proletariat. 
but it is also an uprising of the deepest instincts. And I think this is where Buñuel, I, I always find Buñuel's communism a bit of a mismatch. <laughs> that it, it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable arrangement, as much as Sartre's uh, uh, communism was. It's, it's this, this ideology of surrealism, existentialism, that rely on the irrational and the individual are often not particularly uh, s smooth fit with, um, except of course for the notion of revolution overturning and changing. Um, I mean, I, th I think perhaps that's the reason why someone like Michel Foucault ended up leaving the communist movement. It's, it, it doesn't, doesn't work with that. But, um, but I, I, the one thing that I should, that I will mention on this film is that Buñuel was very aware that the film had two parts. That the first part was very gothic-like. And that ends with the suicide of Don Jaime. And then he says, well, I, he says actually literally, that ends the movie for me. <laughs> so that, that's, as, I, was, I was done. <laughs> I felt that I had done what I wanted to do. But uh, then other ideas came, and I decided to, to move forward with, with the second part. So that the movie is a composite of Don Jaime, Viridiana, then Jorge, Viridiana, and the beggars. So that there are two clear, sharply, you know, divides. So what I said, dualities are constantly being played with. And even though I do see the first part as being rather gothic, the second, maybe not as much. The second part also seems a lot less narrative focused. So at a certain point, it's just uh, this this scene of endless excess that like you lose a sense of a like the first part is actually quite narrative driven and you have a clear almost like a kind of uh, short story structure or something and the second part just does away with that entirely almost. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think that there is the once that feast that wild feast of the beggars gets going. Yeah. Buñuel lingers, lingers on that, and the narrative comes to a to a slight lull or to a lull, and you're you're totally right. And so that then he and the camera travels and enjoys different different scenes and different interactions among those, and 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 they're clearly what's being and, and again this would have upset uh, leftist critics uh, that this seems to the word in Spanish would be regodearse, which means to just take time and just almost pleasure in showing this this chaos. That he, that he does revel in that chaos and that the narrative that's being propelled forward in a sort of very natural style up to that point comes to a temporary stop but it's fairly lengthy. So that this is uh, this again would have contributed to the anger by authorities, and because this is this is not incidental, it's something that the director seems to take a great deal of pleasure in stopping, um, and and focusing and looking at that and this person and that other person and the sexual destructive chaos that ensues. Um, yes, no, I agree. Uh, further questions from the audience? Go back here. Um, I, I understand that uh, uh, Bunuel is uh, pretty much uh, uh, influenced and also aware about uh, Catholicism and, and uh, um, all these themes. I also wonder if he's uh, influenced as well by other things like uh, uh, occultism and Freemason. Not necessarily on this film, but in the next year there will be the uh, exterminating angel, and I believe that there are a lot of these things, so I, I'm interested to, to find out more if, if you know about that. I, I think, I, I mean, I haven't read every single 
Buñuel pay, uh, you know, personal conversation that he was his interest in, in those aspects that you narrate would have been only primarily narrative or filmographic. That is, it wouldn't have been anything personally that would have personally attracted him um, to that supernatural world. So an extremely realistic, naturalistic individual in his, in his own nature. Now that he would use supernatural, the supernatural, yes, indeed. I think in the Exterminating Angel, there are clearly hints of that. There's, there's something that, uh, even in repeated scenes where something is filmed twice, where it's just comp the, the, the natural order of narrative is broken, not necessarily in a, fanta in, in a, in a phantasmagoric or... or or otherworldly style, but certainly in a way that is peculiar and destructive of, of the traditional logical narrative. Not in this movie, but um, but I don't know that he would have been um, an occultist or interested in the occult more than... Maybe not a necessary occult, but maybe Freemason, because I believe that in Exterminating Angel you can see a lot of reference to it, in my opinion. They are making gestures, they are making really funny things that, to me, they indicate that there is some, some awareness about the Freemasonry. What, what aspect of the, in the, what particular scene or sequence drew you to that? Um, I remember that initially there are a sort of an exchange of gesture between two, two persons the, of, of the elite, there is another very interesting thing about exterminating angel, the fact that there is this uh, clear distinction or between the elites and the normal people. So the, 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 the elites remain trapped in, in this mm -hmm. uh, crazy uh, uh, sort of ritual. Another thing that I'm not sure that you have noticed, the villa has a civic number which is 1109, which is in the moment that that you see it, it really struck me. I mean, what is the chance that is by chance? So, I, it's, it's just a thought. I'm, I'm, I don't know if there is something uh, in it, but I would like to know your, your opinion about that. I think that he co-wrote that uh, script. So we'll have to, and I, I'll have to look into the uh, into the other uh, person. But I don't. I mean, I don't think. Uh, I, I, you know, after all, it's a secret brotherhood, but I don't think that, that uh, Buñuel's a Freemason. Now, in this movie, this might not have been something that Freemasons would have enjoyed either. I mean, Freemasonry is philanthropic. And uh, so perhaps, yeah, sure, the attacks on the traditional church, but secular philanthropy failing... And he fails in many ways here too. It's not only the religious philanthropist that fails. Look at this: the scene of the of uh, Jorge buying the dog. What do you see the next? The next one you see is another. There's another dog. Just <laughs> so it's, it, it's we're helpless against the cruelty of human life and of human behavior. There is it's not much, and and if, I'm not so sure that if. Freemason would have would agree with that, uh, but you, hey, uh, this is something I will I'll look into. It, it's an interesting idea. That's it's worth in, worth worth looking into. So we have uh, two last questions here uh, over here, and then behind. Yeah, you. just a remark, not a question. Uh, the scene with the dog you mentioned is basically the flip side of what he tells Veridiana. She saves like I don't say ten beggars, and he asks, "What about the rest?" He does the same with the dog. One might ask, what about the other dogs? It's just, it's like a conveyor belt of dogs tied to carts, <laughs> and he's never going to get rid of all of them. Yeah. I mean, it's also kind of saying that charity is done to make themselves feel better rather than to actually help solve poverty in any sense. It's just to kind of placate your own consciousness, your own guilt about your yeah. privileged status. It, it could be so, yes, and but um, then what? And that's okay. But then the way that the, that those who receive charity respond is <laughs> quite discouraging as well. But it's just like okay, so well, this charity doesn't solve the larger social economic issues. 
But then, does it solve even this small issue? I mean, I suppose the dog didn't bite Jorge, but <laughs> or attack him. But um, so I guess that's the charitable success in the movie. Uh, as far as a humans, well, it's a different story. So um, it's that you're right. It's it's it's, it's the issue. That issue. But then the way that the poor respond is is either leave or turn against the benefactors, and so that's uh, that is that's I think is quite pessimistic, and and it doesn't. It it does. It's not a movie. It's not a film that leaves you with a uh, hopeful or positive perspective. None of Buñuel's films do. Uh, Los Olvidados and others have more of a sense of well, here this is this, this this is the reason, and this is, but not this one. I think there is here um, a, a kind of inconclusive hopelessness that also would have turned off. Uh, the left and the right, uh, and, and and think that this very reflective or very cl very clearly indicative of this mature Buñuel. One of the things that I wanted to talk about and I didn't was the philos philosophy, the philosophical angles. Um, Buñuel was a philosophy major in the university. That's he didn't train in film studies; they didn't exist. He didn't train in art history. He trained in philosophy. And uh, the angle of the, the pessimism, the deep pessimism, some of it, I think, emerging from the Marquis de Sade and also even from, from, uh, from Schopenhauer, whom I understand lived in this town. Uh, it's, uh, it's from Arthur Schopenhauer it's, it's, and, and, and even Nietzsche. Is, is, I, I still to read, maybe, I, I know that I have read everything, but there, someone should do something with that. <laughs> I... there, there is actually uh, one very overt dig at um, the Marxist tradition, actually, when Bridiana says to the beggars, well, you know, after the feast, you're all going to go work. Uh, they don't respond kindly to that. And she says, well, from, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, which obviously, you know, one of the key slogans of <laughs> Marxism yes. um, that's done in a very um, a kind of dig in the ribs kind of way. Uh, but we have one last question. Uh, yeah, uh, we were just talking a little bit about the supernatural, and I was wondering if it would make sense to think about the jumping rope he killed himself with, uh, to think about it as a kind of possessed object, because the camera makes, that pay, makes us pay attention to it a couple of times, and especially in the um, end scene, attempted rape scene. Um, yeah, it kind of came into my head that there's a purpose to be fulfilled, and it's being transported through this object, and maybe the pipe as well in some other cases. Yes, I, I think this, that's another, one could, you're completely right to notice the rope. It's, and you're not alone. <laughs> it has been noticed. Um, one could be metaphorical about it, but it would seem to me like an easy escape from your question. To say that the rope is what ties the entire film together. So that it acts as a kind of surrealist object, is connecting the entire narrative. That is, it's first, uh, it's, it appears in every segment. It's the one object that travels through the film, tying it together. But I think we can also see it as, a, again, the, this, this dumb, blind fortune of objects that can be used for play, for suicide, for uh, as a belt. Is one of the beggars uses it as a belt, or as to or to tie someone down. And there are um, there's, and again, I don't I don't pretend to know the ex and I've, I I I did read all that, so I have no excuse, but I don't pretend to know besides a metaphorical escape that some critics take, that it is an object that connects everything in the film. Like, for example, the shots of the feet. That's another one of these unifying visual uh, angles. What does that mean, the shots of the feet? I mean, what is the actual explanation for this, or the actual explanation for the rope? To tell you the truth, I will have to think 
harder about it. I've thought about it and I have come up with a reason. Maybe, Daniel, you do, do you have any idea? Well, the, the last film we saw in the series uh, a couple months ago now was L, and the, a rope plays a very st- strongly symbolic role at a certain point in the narrative as well. I was wondering if that's a, a potential kind of red thread <laughs> uh, linking his... I mean, you mentioned a feet, the feet, like shots of feet are just littered throughout Bunuel's yeah. um, oeuvre and perhaps a rope also is something that recurs again as this kind of uh, very, very charged image in his films. I mean, one has to also realise, I think, approaching something like this, the films are, and again, I'm not a film theorist or anything, so I'm, I'm out of my depth, perhaps. But just thinking, the films are, are, are narratives, but they are also visual. And that they need not only narrative cohesion, but also visual cohesion. And when an object such as a rope can indicate so many different circumstances, then that provides, just from a filmic perspective, cohesion to the work of art. That whether it has a completely rational and you know, right on our, you know, two pages explaining the rope and the reasons for it, perhaps there isn't such a you know, logical, uh, clear reason. But it works as a, unit, as a unifying theme. Now, the thing with the feet, yeah, sure, well, Buñuel was a fetishist. And then that yes, and it was so that that's that's in every that's in so many of his movies that uh, it, it's 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 so common and from Lash Dog going forward. So that that's so you think all right. So this is a a, a thing that he has, but one could also conceive of a. I would say logical, but I would say a, a rational or a or a or a filmic explanation for it in this the explanation of the feet. I mean, f- feet would suggest also foundation. I think these are the foundations. This is what's real. This is what's really going on. This is where the rubber hits the dirt, like they say in the US. <laughs> this is the this is reality. Feet firmly planted on the ground, all these Con los pies firmemente sobre la tierra. So just to tell you, know, it's not just an English expression. So that it's a reminder that of the realism of what's going on, you know, the reality of it. That's a thought. Plus the other psychosexual stuff. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be both. <laughs> Maybe one last uh, quick and okay. Well, <laughs> we can uh, chat outside perhaps. Uh, but on that note, thank you once again to Fernando for an illuminating lecture uh, and stimulating discussion after the film. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks' time with uh, Gaston Lillo talking about El Bruto from uh, Buñuel's Mexican period. So do come along uh, in two weeks, same time, same place, Thursdays, eight o'clock. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for inviting me. Thanks.